whether you wear glasses or not, whether you have anybody in your family who wears glasses or not, I think every single one of you understands the basic concept of what glasses are for. They make it possible for you to see that which, without them, otherwise you would not be able to see clearly on your own. Now, I had perfect vision most of my life, until I was 18, that is. And when I turned 18 or so, that's when I realized that I needed a pair, and I got my first pair of glasses, which I wore for the next eight years. I remember getting that first pair of glasses. I, I was nearsighted, and uh, which means I couldn't see well far away. If things were blurry, were not as clear as they should. And I remember putting those glasses on, and wow, I mean, what a difference. It's kind of like you could explain it, you know, like watching something on YouTube at extra low resolution, like 360 or something. It's all grainy and flowy, and you can't quite make faces out. And then clicking that button and finding that 4K link and turning it on, and boom, high definition, right? Wow. It, w it was incredible. It was really nice. Now, clear vision is crucial to life, isn't it? One of the ways every single one of you has experienced that is I'm sure that you have been caught in a downpour, in a severe rainstorm. You know, not a drizzle, but so severe, a rainstorm so severe that your wipers working at the speed of, you know, the fastest they can go and you can't see the front of your, you can't see your hood. Even the best of drivers at those moments get really nervous because they can't see what's happening. Or, for instance, have you tried to play basketball, football, or soccer in the dark? Or if you know you're more of a creative type, you're, you're not into sports, have you ever tried drawing something in poor lighting, you know, trying to get the colors right? Or writing or reading, right? No light, you can't do it. You know, sight, if you think about it, makes it possible for us to do things that are essential to life, you know, like driving in a rainstorm, getting to where you need to go, but also make it possible for us to do things in life that are worthwhile and pleasurable. The nursing homes that I work in and people that I get to see very often tell me that vision is the most important aspect of their health for them. Many people say that they would much rather lose hearing, taste, and even mobility as long as they get to keep their sight. Now, I'm pretty sure that's true for most of you because it is true for me as well. Uh, I value my sight very much. Now, the point that I'm trying to make is not you know, a profound, just like earth-shattering information. It's very simple, maybe even a little bit of cl cliche, but seeing to a very large extent, is living. Now, if you remember last week, I gave you a summary statement at the very end of my sermon, a summary takeaway point. Do you remember what it was? Try to shuffle back in your memory. What was that, what I wanted you, kind of the last thing that I wanted you to walk away with? Now, in case you don't remember, let me, I don't know if it's going to be back up here, let me remind you what it was, what it was. This was the takeaway point from last week. Toil and struggle with all you've got to mature and help those around you mature in Christ during this time, knowing that God's power resides in you and will work through your effort because of Christ. Now, I took that out from the last two verses of chapter one. So if you're in Colossians, chapter one, Look here, I'll, I'll point it out to you, verses 28 and 29, where I get this. Paul says, him, meaning Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That's the goal. He wants to present everybody mature in Christ, Christ-like. For this I toil, that's where that part of toiling that comes in my takeaway point. For this I toil, struggling, look at this, with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Now if you look there, those words, that word struggle, it comes from the imagery of an athlete. Now those of you who have been involved in sports, or you know, some of you were probably very sad that the Olympics got postponed to next year, you know the tremendous amount of effort and energy it takes to prepare for a sport. It's exhausting. It takes you to the peak of your 
uh, to the peak of your ability to sustain, right? Some people train so hard that, you know, they're puking afterwards. Or some people, they go through severe injuries in order to play that sport. And in the ancient world, this word struggle, right? If you think about an ancient world form of Olympics where you represented your whole country, you represented the honor, right? To do poorly in a sport was to basically destroy your life. And Paul is saying, he's using this very graphic and intense image, and he's saying, I work with such intensity, sports, athletic-like intensity, in order to bring about Christ-likeness in you. To make you mature in Christ is where Paul's focus and energy is going. And by this, he is highlighting the centrality of us becoming like Jesus, and also, right, also the effort that is required for that to take place in your life. Now becoming more like Jesus, what I try to highlight in my takeaway point is becoming more like Jesus ourselves individually and helping those around us to become like him is at the center of what it means to follow Jesus. It is what we commit to when we become Christians. This is what we strive for. If you think about it, this is the goal of parenting, to help your children become Christ-like. This is the point of discipleship. This is the point of friendship, marriage, etc. And all these things, we're to pursue Christ-likeness. But what does that actually look like? What does it mean to be like Jesus? How do you measure that? What exactly are you aiming for when you're trying to become more like Jesus, how, how do you know that you have become more like Jesus? How do you know when your kids, your spouse, have conformed to the image of Christ? How do you know that you're making good progress? What is it that's giving you clues? So while my takeaway point is important, that you need to toil and struggle with all you've got to mature and to mature those around you, if you... If you're hazy, if you're wishy-washy and kind of just guessing your way through, feeling your way through of what it's like to be like Jesus, it could be a recipe for disaster. And if it's not a recipe for the disaster, then for disappointment for sure because it's a goal that you don't know that you're headed for. You know that if you're making progress or if you've ever reached it and you become frustrated. So you see there on the screen, the title of my message today is Becoming more like Jesus, becoming more like Jesus. This is what verses one through five of chapter two are all about. Before we dive into them and read them, let me show you the connection between what we just, this is why I focused on verses 28, 29 and what we talked about last week a little bit first because look at verse one of chapter two. Paul says, for I want you to know how great a struggle that word struggle is the exact same word he is using in verse 29. So he's connecting. And keep in mind, chapters and verses were not put into the Bible by Paul, right? It's not that the Colossians got four chapters. They got one letter. It was a unified whole, and the the flow of thought, it's interwoven together. And so Paul says, I'm struggling with all my energy that God is working in me to make everybody mature in Christ. And I want you to know how great a struggle, right? This is what I'm struggling for you And for those at Laodicea and all who have not seen me face to face, Paul is saying, this is what I'm after. That. You see that? You see that that, that in verse 2 of chapter 2? What Paul is saying there is that I'm I'm toiling and struggling so that you would become more mature in Christ, by which I mean the following. In other words, verses two and three, as we will see, Paul is actually gonna highlight for us, he's gonna help us see better. There's that connection to my intro. He's gonna help us see what it means to become more like Jesus. And so I want you to read this passage with me now in its entirety, verses one through five, and in your mind, be thinking about it. What does this passage teach me about? What does it mean to become more like Jesus? Colossians chapter two, verse one. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. That their hearts may be encouraged, being being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding 
and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. In this passage, we will see the Apostle Paul highlight three aspects, three aspects of what, it, what we are to pursue in order to become mature in Christ. They're found in verses two and three primarily, so we're gonna spend most of our time today focusing on those two verses. And what we're gonna see is that Paul is focusing on an encouraged heart, one, a unity built on love, and thirdly, a life centered on Jesus. Let's look at them individually. Don't worry if you didn't catch all of them. Let's look at them individually. Verse two, Paul says, first of all, what does it mean to be like Jesus? He says, that their hearts may be encouraged. Here's the first point that I want you to remember of what it means to become Christ-like. It is to cultivate an encouraged heart. It is to cultivate an encouraged heart. Now, what does it mean to have an encouraged heart? What is the meaning of that? What is the significance of that? How do we understand that? I probably don't need to spend too much time telling you that Paul is not talking about our cardio, their cardiovascular or our cardiovascular health, right? He's not saying that I'm hoping and I'm struggling and toiling to make sure that you don't have hypertension or congestive heart failure, right? Kids, when Apostle Paul and actually frequently when the Bible is talking about the heart, it's not talking about the muscle in your chest right here that you've had to memorize in anatomy, maybe draw. Well, is, is he then talking about a certain way of feeling? You know, Paul says, I want you to have an encouraged heart, right? Because we most often, when we think about heart, we're thinking about feelings, right? Not having negative emotions, for instance, such as doubt, fear, loneliness, dis- depression, discouragement. You know, not to be of a lowly spirit. Paul is saying, I want you to be in high spirits. I want you to feel good. I want you to have a positive attitude. Is that what Paul is talking about? Now, again, I think this is probably the most frequent way when we think about this, when Paul says, I want you to have an encouraged heart. Mainly, that he is talking about our emotions, our feelings. Now, in the ancient world and in the Bible, the heart did refer in a certain way to emotions and feelings, but it referred to much, much more than that. In fact, let me give you a couple examples, and there's hundreds of the examples, but let me just give you a couple examples of how the word heart is used in the Bible. All of you remember probably when Samuel was sent to choose David to replace Saul, right? First Samuel chapter 16, verse seven. You remember this. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart, right? But the Lord looks at the heart. In other words, God says, he's not saying that I look at how David's emotional state is. And David happens to be the most emotionally healthy out of his seven brothers. God is looking at something much more significant than simply how David was feeling. In Judges chapter 16, if you remember, this is an instance with Samson when Delilah is trying to seduce him and she's trying to figure out the source of his strength. Judges chapter 16, verse 17, and he told her all his heart. What is that? A razor has never come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaven, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man, right? He's sharing his heart. It's not that he's sharing just her feelings. He's sharing the very essence, as you see there, of what makes him who he is. If you go to the New Testament, if you go to the New Testament, Jesus, this is what Jesus says, for, from, for this people's heart has grown dull. He's not, uh, this is Matthew chapter 13, verse five, when Jesus says, for this people's heart has grown dull, he's not saying they are emotionless. They have ceased to be able to feel emotion. Look, with their ears they can barely hear, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. And understand with their heart and turn 
and I would heal them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul talking about contributions to the work of the gospel, he says, each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And here we see that interplay with emotions, right? You need to be cheerful in how you give, but Paul is not saying, hey, see how you're feeling about it. He's talking about how you decided within and what you've decided in your heart that should be a cheerful expression of your commitment to the gospel, how you give. Let me give you one more. One last one again. There's hundreds. Romans chapter 10. Right, There's a very good passage in verses 9 and 10 where it talks about what does it take to become a Christian. Notice here, verse 9, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Clearly, Paul has a lot more in mind there than just saying, and feel in your heart. I feel that God really did raise Jesus from the dead, right? You believe with your heart, right? If you, if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one does what? With the heart you believe. See, in the Bible, feelings and emotions are much more often actually referred to as the gut. And the seed of who you are, the very being, your very being, your thoughts, your affections, everything that makes up who you are is found in the heart. So I hope you see that while, when speaking of the heart, the Bible does have emotions in mind. It has a lot more in mind. In fact, let me read you how one Bible dictionary tries to summarize all the uses of the Bible in the heart. This is from the New Bible Dictionary. It says, the heart was essentially, or the heart essentially means the whole man with all his attributes, physical, intellectual, and psychological. The heart was conceived of as the governing center of all of these. In other words, the heart governs your physical attributes, your intellect, your psychological attributes. It is the heart which makes a man or a beast what he is and governs all his actions. Character, personality, will, mind are modern terms which all reflect something of the meaning of heart, right? So character, personality, will, mind is what we can, in the modern sense, say is synonymous with the biblical use of the word heart. This means that heart comes the nearest to mean person. So when Paul says you would be encouraged in the heart, right? So that their hearts may be encouraged, verse 2 there. He's not talking about how they're feeling, but he's rather talking about their whole persons, the very center of their being, what they stand on, how they identify, how they understand themselves to be, to be encouraged. Now to help us better understand that, maybe it would be helpful to also think about the opposite of encouraged. What is the opposite of encouraged? I mean, even kids know this, right? Kids, what is the opposite of being encouraged? It's to be discouraged. Now think about that. Think about being discouraged. Being truly discouraged has a lot, is not simply feeling down. Right? It's, it's a lot more than just like, I'm feeling down, I, I don't feel like I can do this. No, to be truly discouraged is to lose hope and purpose. It is to be at the very pits of despair. Just feel like I'm a failure. I'm a complete loser. I can't do anything right. I'm unable to get, get out of the state. Anything that I try to, it all falls apart. As hard as I, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how I try. It doesn't matter what, I, what help I enlist. It's just horrible. I can't do this. Right? That's what it means to be discouraged. I'm sure that most of you know what that is. Now, what Paul is saying that here is that he wants the absolute opposite of that for them. In fact, being full of hope and purpose or being encouraged is what it means to be Christ-like. That's what we should be pursuing, right? To be encouraged at his heart let me put it this way. To be encouraged at your heart means to have courage to live life and face the challenges it throws at us. And boy, do we have a lot of challenges that we're facing regularly, especially in a pandemic season like this. Challenges at home 
with the kids or with health or with your spouse, challenges with work, challenges with the society at large. Now, it seems like there's little to be encouraged by, especially, I know that some of you are more inclined to be pessimistic, and it seems like the whole world is caving in and crashing. And so Paul is saying, I want you, I want you to cultivate, to cultivate an encouraged heart. How do you become more like Jesus? You cultivate an encouraged heart. Now on the surface, on the surface, it almost seems like Paul is advocating here something like, you know, a positive thinking attitude that is so prevalent in our secular culture today. Isn't it? I mean, this is what we hear around in the news, just think positive, say good things to yourself, encourage yourself, look on the bright side of things. In the sense we're talking about being like Jesus, I think a certain incident from his life demonstrates what it means to have an encouraged heart beautifully. If you turn to John chapter 14, you remember that this is Jesus his last evening. In John chapter 14, we see Jesus' last evening with his disciples. This is the upper room discourse. In just a couple hours, he is going to be betrayed. He's going to be betrayed. In fact, chapter 13, <clears throat> the last few verses tell us that he's going to be betrayed by his closest followers like Peter and also by Judas and the nation at large. And then he's going to be crucified and killed. Right? So Jesus knows this is all about to happen. Now let's see what's happening. Is he the one who's discouraged? Chapter 14, verse 1. He looks at the disciples and he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Wait, that, that's backwards. Jesus is about to be betrayed. Jesus is about to be left alone. Jesus is about to be flogged. Jesus is about to be embarrassed. Jesus is about to be crucified. And even left by God, right? In a mysterious way. And yet, this is Jesus looking at his disciples. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? He's saying, look, if there wasn't a better place that I'm going to prepare for you, wouldn't I, would I lie to you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also, his disciples are encouraged when they hear and they find out that he's leaving them. And he is encouraging them. And what is he encouraging them with? Think about that. What is he encouraging them with? He is encouraging them with promises. Promises about the life to come. Promises about what he's doing, what he's accomplishing. Promises about the fact that he will not leave them and that he is going to be with them. We see here where Jesus' heart was, why he was so encouraged, because Jesus knew that victory was the way, that the cross was the way to victory. That going through pain and suffering through death was the way to defeat Satan and sin. He knew that there is coming a time when the new heaven and the new earth would be rushed in and where all those who love God will be reunited in perfection with God and with each other without any pain or without any suffering. This is what made Jesus an encourager and courageous to live life and face life. Friends, here's the heart of the difference between secular positive thinking and what Jesus and Paul are advocating for here. They are calling you to a certain sense to positive thinking, but a positive thinking that is grounded and centered on God. An encouraged heart that finds its peace and his promises. Friends, you know what an encouraged heart is all about? It's about your faith. It's about your faith. An encouraged heart is a heart that believes and grows in faith of the God it professes and in the promises that he promises. Let me say that again, or read that again, actually. An encouraged heart is one that believes and grows in faith of the God it professes and in the promises that that God promises. When George Whitfield was preaching 
in Edinburgh. He was getting people early up out of beds. And uh, during one of those trips, somebody was going there, and they took a look to their right, and they guess who they saw? They saw David Hume heading with them to the tabernacle to, he, to hear George Whitefield preach. Now, if you don't know David Hume, David Hume was a Scottish philosopher and skeptic. In fact, one of the greatest skeptics of Christianity, he wrote some influential tomes that underlined the Christian faith uh, like few philosophers of the past have. In other words, he was not a friend or a believer. And so this person looks at David Hume and says, I thought you did not believe the gospel. To which Hume replied, I don't, but he does. You see, friends, George Whitfield drew people like David Hume, Benjamin Franklin in America who were not believers in the gospel because they lived like they believed what they preached. This is what an encouraged heart is. It's a heart that is holding on to God and to his promises, that is not afraid of the physical, spiritual forces that are coming up against them. This is a heart that takes a look at the world that is falling apart due to disease or economics or anything else due to persecutions, and it's a heart that says, my God is above this. My God will lead me through. My God has answers. I'm not alone. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to have all the answers. I know that he who began a good work in me will lead it to perfection in Jesus Christ. I know that I've entrusted to Jesus my life, my family, everybody, and he is faithful, able to provide for me. Now, friends, if you see there, I purposely inserted the word cultivate, an encouraged heart. I think it's an especially relevant word for many of you in the springtime. You're beginning to take a look at your lawns. You're beginning to take a look at your flower beds, your vegetable patches, right? And you know that if you let things be, a lot of weeds, a lot of issues will come up. In order for your lawn to look good, in order for your flower bed to be beautiful, in order to have some vegetables a little bit down the road in the summer or fall, you need to cultivate. You need a lot of purposeful, diligent work. Friends, it takes cultivation of our hearts in order for them to be encouraged, in order for them to be full of courage to live for the glory of God. You know, this time of the pandemic is exposing who we are believing and also gives us an opportunity to cultivate our faith in God. Let me ask you a few questions. Are you believing God or the world around you in what will bring you happiness? You know, this time, it's a a good time to reflect when maybe your means of providing for your family have been taken away and you don't know maybe how you're going to pay for your mortgage. Or the vacation got canceled. Or the career that you were studying and you were about to graduate is no longer so sure that it will be available. Is your faith anchored in God and your happiness anchored in Him providing for you and leading you through or in what the world has been promising to you? How about another question? Are you believing yourself or what God is saying about you in your failure? I know for those who are passionate and love God and want to be good stewards of the mercies of God and they want to be influencers for the gospel and their families, I know that sometimes new circumstances, difficult circumstances bring up the worst in us. They bring up new failures that we never experienced. We didn't know that we could be so annoyed with our spouses. We didn't know that we could be so angry and resentful towards our government. Lots of different things we, we thought that we, we, we didn't know that we would be so covetous and jealous. And so as you look, are you believing yourself that you're a, maybe a failure, that you continue to sin? Or are you believing what God tells you about yourself and the power that resides within you? Do you know God's promises about you and your future or are they pushed out by the allurements and promises of the world? Friends, this is a time for us to reflect on and to see where does our heart find encouragement. If you turn with me for just a moment to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, we have this really interesting passage there from the Apostle Paul as he's writing to the believers in Thessalonica. He says, 
chapter 1, verse 6, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, look at this, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. With the joy of the Holy Spirit. Friends, it is God through the powerful working of his Holy Spirit that can give you that joy, that encouraged and courageous heart to live. This is a time to ask yourself, have I been, have I been prioritizing for the Holy Spirit, opportunities for the Holy Spirit to speak into my life from his word, from my quiet time in prayer with him, from listening to helpful preaching and podcasts and books, to turning my eyes, ears, attention to the things that are going to build my faith? Or am I constantly on checking the news, seeing how bad things are? Am I constantly questioning why God allows this and, and, and hearing other alternative voices? Friends, this is a time to revisit your Bibles, revisit and look at the promises of God. Do you look to yourself in order to sustain your family and living here or do you looking to the power of God who says I will never lead you or forsake you? Are you looking to God who's telling you no temptation has overtaken you but such as common to man. God is faithful. He will provide for a way out. Are you trusting in God to sustain you and to lead you or something else? To be like Jesus is to have his heart and even before Gethsemane he was the one encouraging his disciples. So friends, cultivate, work, dig out the weeds, cultivate an encouraged heart. Secondly, Paul says that their hearts may be encouraged being knit together in love. Being knit together in love. The second aspect of what it means to be Christ-like is to pursue a unity built on love. The first aspect of an encouraged heart has to do who you are on the inside, what kind of a person you are. A person that has deep faith, encouragement in God, confidence and courage in him. In other words, your outlook on life. The second aspect of being knit together in love has to do with our relationship to others. In fact, if you look closely there, Paul's focus is not even so much on love, but it's on unity, unity which is built on love. Look again, being knit together, like the point there is to be knit together, right? Like a pattern, like a, if, you, um, if you crochet, a pattern that puts you in a beautiful hole, being knit together in love. Now let me, let me think with you about that for just a moment. Before the quarantine, I would venture to say that many families, many wives, for instance, wished for more time together with their husbands, with their children. Many of you businessmen, many of you who've been workaholics, working hard, I'm sure at times have thought like, man, so much work, I wish I could just take a break. I wish it, I could have more time to spend with family, I wouldn't have to worry about all this stuff related to my work. And here we are. Many of us have got our wish. Yet, you've probably found that apart from the financial maybe pressures or the health things, that being quarantined together without exposure to others, without being able to do anything else, having this indefiniteness is actually a lot harder than it sounds. Maybe it's just my family. Maybe because we're weak or whatever. Maybe it's just us. But we're seeing new tensions and frustrations come to the surface. Between me and my wife, between me and the kids, what we expect out of each other. Now as you look at that situation, what is it that can unify us? What is it that can unify our families, our church? What is it that we are called to in that moment? Paul says, being knit together in love. True lasting unity in your families, at home right now. True lasting unity between husbands and wives. True lasting unity in between siblings. True lasting unity between friends. True lasting unity of a church can only come as a result of love. Peter O'Brien says, love, love in all its breadth then refers to the foundation of the Christian life. Now, I know that this is 
like so Christianese. It's so cliche. Like we've heard this a hundred times. But friends, love is that one thing that can hold us together. And this pandemic, more than anything, it's testing our faith in God individually. And as we are stuck together, our love for one another. I mean, you remember Jesus saying, by this all people will know that you are my disciples in John 13, 35. How will people know that you are my disciples? If you have what? Love for one another. The amount and type of screaming that goes on in home, right? And blame shifting or acceptance. Let me just slow down here for a moment because what is love? Let me ask you this. What is she talking about? Now, I know, I know that you are all very well versed. You're wonderful Christians. And you know that love has to do with what? Unconditional, right? Agape. Unconditional commitment to the good of others. Right? Is that what love is? Now, I do think that is true. Love is about an unconditional commitment to the good of others. I do think that it's missing a crucial ingredient. An element or an ingredient without which unconditional commitment to the good of others falls apart and really is not biblical at all. Let me put it starkly to you this way. Love is not simply an unconditional commitment to the good of others. Now let's look again at the example from the life of Jesus. If you still have your Bibles somewhere around John, you can turn to John chapter 13. We were in John 14. Let's look at the example of Jesus, John 13. This is how the, actually the, in the, the whole episode of the upper room discourse begins. When Jesus gathers with the disciples. You know this passage very well, but let me read through, through it for you. Now before the feast, verse 1, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, how did he demonstrate it? What is it talking about? During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going back to God, there's that encouraged heart, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel that was wrapped around him. I mean, for us, it's it's impossible to understand how scandalous this was. In in an honor-shame culture, society, I mean, this this is uh, unbelievably scandalous and um, could be embarrassing. That's why when he came to Simon Peter, verse 6, Lord, do you wash my feet? Right, Peter's saying, this is backwards. You're shaming yourself. Jesus answered him, what I'm doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. All over the place. Jesus said to him, to the, to the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but it's completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was be- to betray him. And that's why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, look at verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments, resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for I am so. If I'm then your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, no, a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, there's the very important, don't miss verse 17 and that word, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Now we rightly focus, when we look at that example, we rightly focus on what Jesus did. Isn't that so? This is love. It really is love. What Jesus did is love. It's huge. It's extremely important that Jesus demonstrated his love. He didn't just communicate good sentiments like, I care about you. I'm going to die for you. I'm feeling, you know, I'm feeling these emotions for you. No, he actually did something. 
But what I want to turn your attention is not what Jesus did, but what is implied in the passage. It's the attitude with which Jesus was washing the feet of his disciples. What do you think was his attitude? Do you think that as Jesus was washing their feet, what do you think was important to them? The fact that he was washing their feet or the attitude with which he was doing it? It's both. It's both. Can you imagine Jesus grumbling as he washed his feet? Like, you are so ungrateful and I have to like do this for you and I I have to like die for you. Imagine Jesus just being bitter about the fact that the disciples still didn't get it. Or the fact that he'd go to the cross complaining. This is so not fair. I'm the, I'm the least. This is so unjust. I mean, you know this, right? You know when your friends or your family, your spouses or your kids or your parents, when they do something out of love, right? When they are doing it unconditionally towards you with an attitude that does not demonstrate love you know the problem with us often is not that we don't do acts of love towards them I mean as as a parent I know that you know the amount of unconditional love I have towards my kids but the often the problem is our inner attitude here's how I would put it here's the question that I would want you to think do you love to love do you love to love those around you Well, those around you say, this person loves to have an unconditional interest of my best, right? You see, there's a very big difference of being unconditionally committed to somebody's good versus loving to be stuck with that, loving to be unconditionally committed to somebody's good. To be like Jesus is not simply washing our kids' feet and spouses' feet and the feet of others, right? Sometimes literally, To be like Jesus, to love, is to love doing that. It is to view it as the greatest privilege we are given, right? Jesus loved his own to the end, not by simply washing their feet through, you know, grunting teeth like, why aren't you doing this? But with such joy, with such privilege that I, your Lord, before I'm dying for you, I'm going to do the work of the slave, I'm going to treat you in this way. That's the example. The example is not the act only. The example is the attitude. You see there that word that I used, pursue. Pursue to be unified by love. What are you pursuing? Are you pursuing more attention? More attention, more more care towards you. Are you pursuing so that people, your husband would notice how much, how much you do for the kids? He's home, now he can finally see, right? Are you pursuing so that you would see how much you give out for the kids? How, how much you do for the family? Husbands, are you maybe pursuing so that your wife would appreciate how much you've provided for her when you've worked? Maybe his friends, now that you're far, far away, you're hoping, you know, hopefully they'll notice my absence and the... the, the they'll understand how how important that friendship was and how much I gave to them. Are you communicating an attitude of that you love the privilege to serve unconditionally those around you? Friends, this is what being like Jesus is all about. Kids, kids, you know that this is so important, this applies to you, right? How you obey your parents. I'm sure your parents have talked to you about your attitude. I'm sure you know that there's a difference between gladly sharing something with your siblings, gladly doing a chore. A chore. I'm sure you know the difference between when you say, if you do this for me, mom, dad, then I'll do this, right? That is not, kids, the way of Jesus. Think about the attitude that Jesus had. When your sibling wants to take something away from you. When they want that toy. When they want to watch that movie. Are you going to be the one that says, I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to enjoy the fact that I get to serve you through this. You're going to clean the table. Wash the dishes. Vacuum the house. 
when your parents ask with joy saying, this is so cool that I get to participate and lift the burden for my mom. Friends, as you look around, as you look at what this afternoon holds, having lunch, dinner together, as you think about what tomorrow is going to bring about, as you think about the challenges you will face on Thursday afternoon, pursue, pursue a unity that is built on love. On the one hand, it will, I guarantee, transform you. When you love to love, when you love to do those things, it'll change you. But it will also change your family. Imagine if husbands are doing that, wives are doing that, children are doing that, neighbors are doing that. Imagine what peace and what freedom it brings. This is why in the upper room discourse, in chapter 14 at the beginning, right, Jesus is the one that's saying, don't, be, don't let your hearts be troubled. I know you're going to betray me. I know you're going to be scared right now. I know I'm going to be flogged. I know I'm going to be on the cross. But I love to love you. I love to do this for you because I know of what is going to produce. If you and I don't have love like this, let me tell you, this pandemic, this time together is going to ruin our families. It's going to ruin our church. But if we love to love, we are like Jesus. And we will build our families strong. Thirdly, thirdly, let's go back to the book of Colossians. Paul says, being knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Here's the point. Here's the point that Paul is trying to make in these verses. Transform your life to center on Jesus. Transform your life to center on Jesus. I know what kind of a person you are, but I hate superlatives. What are superlatives? You know, somebody says like, my kid, you know, my kids will ask you, what's, dad, what's your favorite color? I don't know. <laughs> Let me alone. Or somebody asks, you know, like, what is the best book you've ever read? Or what, what is the most important biblical truth? Or what is the most important thing in marriage? Or what is the best place to vacation? Okay, so I know some of you, you, you do just fine and you, you can just boom, boom, boom. I, I just can't. I hate superlatives. Because I'm, I'm always like, well, it depends. Right? It, it depends for what? What was the best book for what? Marriage? Theology? Practice? Parent? I mean, right? It all, it all depends. Vacation? What is, I mean, it depends what time of the year, what you're after. Anyway, I'm a complicated person. I hate superlatives. Because I always think there is, depending on the situation, depending on what's happening, things might change around. Superlatives seem to, for me, superlative answer seems to box you in, not give you a way out. What we have in this passage, though, is a God-ordained superlative that is absolutely true. Look at these, ver- these words again. This is a superlative and it's absolutely true and it's boxed in and there's no way out. He is saying he wants them to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ. The very epicenter of the universe, the very epicenter of what God is doing, the zenith of all creation is Jesus in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and of knowledge hidden there it's interesting it talks about hidden it's not talking about something that is uh, you know like you have to go on an easter egg hunt like a treasure that you gotta somehow figure out where it's at look for clues rather hidden means something that is deposited stored up so it's not concealed but rather something that you can go and access kind of like if you have money in the bank right they're not they're, they're hidden in the bank. But the point there is that money in the bank is money that is stored up. It's deposited there. So you can go take and use for when you need it. In fact, we're running out of time. But if you go to Luke chapter 24 there, the incident of the road to Emmaus, you will see that Jesus saw all of human history being written and happening for the purpose of his coming, redeeming, and um, being glorified. And thus, our lives as well are to be that way. 
Douglas Moo writes, Christ is the one in whom is to be found all that one needs in order to understand spiritual reality and to lead a life pleasing to God. If you look at there, the the way, again, we can take a look at all these different words here, but this is like a run-on sentence, just um, adjective upon adjective. I mean, you, you, you get lost. And that's the point that Paul is writing here. He says, all the riches, full assurance, understanding, knowledge, treasure, wisdom, knowledge again, all of that is found in Jesus Christ. Now I say that to be Christ-like is to transform your life to center around Jesus. Now, the one example that I could think of that, that kind of, it, this, is, this is difficult to explain because this is so Christianese. This is so, again, uh, pie in the sky type of stuff. But do you remember the story of the Christian in Pilgrim's Progress? If you don't, take time to read that book. This is wonderful. There's a ton of Christian, uh, a ton of kids' versions that you could read with your kids. There's adult, contemporary, old language. There's so many different words. But that is a beautiful illustration of what it means to transform your life so that it's centered around Jesus. When Christian first discovers that he has a weight on his back and he lives in the city of destruction, remember? He has one goal that the evangelist tells him, and that's to go to the wicker gate. Right? It's a gate far away that he sees, but he knows that the only purpose he has in life to have relaxation, to have freedom of his burden, where he will be at peace is if he gets there. And it doesn't matter where he goes, where he falls off, that is his north star. That is what guides him. Once he walks through that gate, remember what happens? He comes to the cross, his burden is taken off, and then he is given the light, which is the celestial city. And the path, the narrow path, leads to this light. It's far away, he can't see it. There's mountains, terrains, there's difficulties, there's giant despair, there's a polyan that he must fight, there's places of rest, there's hills to climb, and so forth. But the point there is that Jesus is the north star for him. The celestial city where he will meet the king is his north star. It is his orientation point. Look, the word there that I use, transform, talks about a change, a battle. In other words, it talks about how we see reality. Look, how you evaluate what's happening in your life is largely influenced by how you see reality, how you value, how you think what it is that's going to bring you joy, how you evaluate if what you're doing is worthwhile or not. Paul says to be like Christ is to be centered on Christ. In other words, and we've talked about this, so I won't spend too much time. You can go back and listen. We talked about this when we dealt with Paul's prayer in verses nine through chapter one, verses nine through 14. But it's about seeing everything in relationship to God and to his gospel. I like how that poem by Shedd says, only one life to live, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. Is that how you're living? Is that how you're understanding your life? Is that what you're seeking to transform? Look, all of us are pre-programmed and constantly so many things go around us to make us hope and pursue things that are not ultimately done for Christ. That's why I call, this passage calls us to transformation, a walk, a battle. And each one of you families, this is why I'm sort of hesitant to give you steps because each one of you is in a different place. You have different temptations, you have different difficulties. Some of you are wealthier, some of you are poorer, some of you are educated, less educated, practical, theoretical, loans, no loans, Married, not married, with kids, grandparents. But are you transforming? Are you transforming so that you're more and more realizing my life is about Jesus? Now look at how Paul ends this section. It's really important. This is where I want to conclude with. He's saying, I say this, I want to say this with Paul, even though this is so Christianese, and I understand, friends, this is, so I prayed at the beginning. I understand that talking about encouraged heart, love, unity and love, 
being centered on Jesus. I know this is like, oh, we've heard as well. It's really easy to just been there, done that, heard that. Paul says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I'm absent in body, yet I'm with you in spirit. Look at what Paul is saying. That while in, at the end of verse 5, he says, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. He's saying, I'm glad of who you are and where you are in Christ. The firmness and your growth. But I am worried that even though you're mature and good, I am worried that if you're not careful, that will change. That will change. I want us to think about that verse 4 in conclusion. He says that nobody may delude you with plausible arguments. What I just described in the verses 2 and 3 about Christ's likeness requires eyes of faith to hold on to and to commit, doesn't it? Believing that that's what will bring you happiness and purpose and committing and doing it even when it's difficult. But because it's so central, this is where Satan will attack us. And look at how Paul is highlighting. He says that you would not be deluded. It doesn't mean to delude something. To dilute it, in essence. Right? Imagine you're getting your two shots of coffee, right? Pouring it. And somebody takes a 32-ounce cup and adds 32 ounces of water to it. It's going to be pretty nasty as coffee. If you like that type of coffee, I'm sorry. Um, but that's not how coffee is supposed to be drank. Right? For 32 ounces, you need more than two shots. Right? Or you can think of any, other, any number of examples. Right? You're trying to, if you're coloring, somebody takes that beautiful red that you have and just dilutes it where it becomes opaque pink. Right? The point is that it's not that it's going to lead you away, but he's going to dilute the centrality of these things. Right? Yeah, it, it's important to be to know God, it's important to um, be encouraged, it's important to believe God's promises. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's really important, but I, I really need to know, you know how the stock market is doing and what, what the, the job situation is like. Like, that's going to encourage me, that's okay. Or yeah, 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 loving and, and enjoying and, and loving to love, definitely central. But, but I really need my kids to learn how to behave. I really need to know, they, they really need to get into good schools. Or, I mean, we can't survive. We, we're not going to go on vacation this year or something like that, right? Whatever. Or, yeah, yeah, Jesus is central, blah, blah, blah. You know, Jesus, Jesus, but life is life. That's that dilution that happens when we sort of say, yes, 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 that's true. But in reality, we are living differently. Paul says, delude you with plausible arguments. This is so crucial. For most people, crazy does not take you very far. Crazy does not take you very far, right? If you think about the things that you believe, the things that challenge you in the Christian life are plausible things. They're good, plausible arguments. Like, does God really control everything when there's so much pain and suffering? Am I really to love serving my family and do it unconditionally and with joy when they don't notice it and they put me down? Is God really fair to me when I fail at so many different things? Is the Bible really true? With because there's people say you know not everybody there's so many different interpretations and people say there's a lot of errors. Right, plausible things, plausible things. Paul says I'm worried that it will delude you from that. And this is what I'm worried for myself. This is what I'm worried for all of you as we are far away. I know that all of you are watching way more TV than you ever did before. Watching way more movies, TV shows. You're reading way more news and interacting with all sorts of things that are happening in the world way more than before. I know that you are way less than before surrounded by good Christian family and probably spending less time in the Bible, in preaching, right? Before, there's time in Bible study in groups, taking kids to uh, Grace Kids, youth groups, Wednesday services, Thursday, uh, Sunday night services, Foundations of Faith classes. I know that all of that has become a lot less. Here's what I'm worried, is that the concentration of Christian life and following after Jesus is being diluted because so much more other stuff is being poured in that is plausible and that is anti-Christ. 
that what you have had in terms of your good faith, the firmness of your faith and order will be washed out. Look, let me give you a moment. Just bow your heads, bow your heads and give you just a moment to reflect and to pray. As far as it relates to your encouragement, your love and unity, your, the centrality of Jesus to your life. Take a moment, take 30 seconds, take a minute to ask the Holy Spirit right now to convict you, to rebuke you, to reveal to you where you need to become more like Jesus. Don't be afraid. Right now, maybe is the time for you to repent. Maybe right now is the time for you to ask for forgiveness and strength. So let me give you a moment to do that where you're seated and then I will pray. Father, I thank you that to be like Jesus is not rocket science. Thank you for his example, washing his disciples' feet, dying on the cross for us. Thank you for his example of being encouraged and the one who with joy did what he did. Thank you so much that you're given us a north star, him, according to whom to orient all our life. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us where we have not done that. Forgive us where this pandemic is bringing those things up and we don't want to repent. Lord, help every single person here to cultivate, to pursue, to transform our lives after the likeness of Christ because that's what will grow us and give us stability of faith and firmness, ability to influence and enjoy and love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.